So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, again, thank you for joining the College of Business Administration at Loyola Marymount University for our webinar series, Impact Insights. We're so pleased to have you join us as we discuss how businesses can navigate the changing landscape as a result of the COVID pandemic. We are dedicated to bringing you valuable insights and doing our part to create a stronger Los Angeles and beyond. This series is aligned with our mission to advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the Los Angeles and global, and global community. So before we get started, I just wanna talk a little bit about some webinar and community guidelines. Uh, your uh, screen should be set to speaker view as we speak. Um, if you have any questions uh, during the presentation, please feel free to type it in the Q&A window um, or the chat window, and we will address these questions at the end of, of the presentation. Although you know, there may be some questions that pop up that we'll definitely address during the presentations. We will leave time at the very end for Q&A. Um, you're also welcome to raise your hand and we will unmute you. As a friendly reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will be available after the presentation. So we are very excited to have Lou Jaffe, the godfather of video conferencing, join us today. Lou has led the growth, successful turnarounds of more than 20 underperforming companies, public and private, as their chief executive or outside advisor in a variety of industries, creating over 1 billion, and that's with a B, in shareholder value. Lou's greatest strengths include leadership, vision, and building plans that teams can execute with great success. Um, Lou is a clinical professor and an entrepreneur in residence at Loyola Marymount University and the Fred Kiesner Center for Entrepreneurship Management and teaches the MBA and undergraduate students. Mr. Jaffe will be talking to us today about video conferencing and how it's become part of our day-to-day -day lives, but more importantly, how to include video conferencing in your workflow as your organizations adapt to the new realities in our post-COVID world. So without further ado, Lou, it's all you. Thank you. So I'm just gonna um, put up a screen real quickly for everyone. And so we can uh, share some content. Content. So thank you all. Um, it's nice to see some familiar names in the um, in the chat bot. And please, Nola will, if, as you're typing questions, she'll bring them up to me. And anything I can address, I really want to help you out with. So I thought I'd start off with something just to level set, so we're, where we're all at, because we've all experienced this meeting. Trip Crosby has joined the meeting. Beth has joined the meeting. Hello? Tyler? No, this is Beth from ICS. Oh, hey, Beth. Thanks. How are you doing? Uh, oh, good. Yeah, just making it, you know. Tyler has joined the meeting. All right. Well, uh, this is Trip. Who's here? Tyler's here. Beth's here. Okay. The purpose of today's meeting is to discuss the. Yeah, I'll be able to do it in like thirty minutes. John has joined the meeting. Hi, John. Hi. I was just trying to go over the purpose of today's meeting, which is to discuss the deliver. Tyler has joined the meeting. Sorry guys, I got cut off. Is Paul here? Send him the invite. Put in your access code. No, 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 that's your PIN number. It should be a nine digit number. Try pressing the pound key. Paul. Has joined the meeting. Any questions before we move on? Yes, this is Beth. What's our best plan of attack for the second quarter? Question actually. what we should do. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, well, I think well, what we should do it is It actually really depends on it. how you look at you it, because the really come... I... Go ahead. Go ahead. I think Given what sales, we... we're really... at a little... Think... Let me just say that... Okay. That's a great graph, John. Uh, Tyler? Well, my main concern with the projections from last year was that... 
they're just insufficient. I mean, they're not even taking into account. Did we, uh, did we lose Tyler again? Hello? John, are you guys taking distributions? John? Oh, my bad. I was on mute. Um, let me, let me start over. So I've prepared a presentation. I'm sharing it with all of you. You should be able to see it on your screen right now. Got it. I don't see a link anywhere. It says I need to download a plugin. We are all using Macs, I'm assuming? Yeah. 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 How can you? Of course. Um, Financials are looking great. Paul, do you have any comments on staffing? I was thinking about that because we get a few more contractor types in. Hold on, I'm sorry. Rex, get down! I don't know. I feel like when I look at the numbers last quarter, that could really tell a huge difference. So if you want to really tighten that up, then I don't know. To me, staffing is a huge impact. What is that? Is that me? Is that me? It's not me, I don't think. I just want to go over a couple of details as we move into our next section here. Um, we got three new departments coming on. I think I'm breaking up a little bit, guys. By the end of Q3. Driving so to a dead I need spot. everyone to give me detailed evaluations each Sorry, month guys. so that we know. That's it, guys. Beth, you'll send out a recap email that could have basically taken the place of this whole meeting, correct? Yep, always do. Yeah, thanks for doing that, Beth. Dave, you've been here the whole time? Yeah. Huh. Well, thanks, everyone, once again. Oh, one more. So I thought I'd start off with, with, with that um, video because there's so many things that every one of us, and I was getting some text messages, we all laugh at it, but we are all used to those things because we have a tendency, people don't get trained on how to do a meeting properly, both on the technology side, and I'd like to introduce some concepts that I call video hygiene and video accountability. And video hygiene is just the concept of what do people see? What do people hear? And how do you behave? And you have video etiquette. Make sure that people don't talk over each other. These little things change how people experience your meetings. Now, all of you on this call are either an entrepreneur or you're in a leadership role or you're a CEO. And the beauty of video conferencing, because it's such a powerful medium, it allows you to be that leader and leaders tell a story. And what is that story you want to have? And how do you put it inside that framework of holding a meeting? So you're a conductor. Who do you include? Who don't you include? Because one of the big problems that we have in meetings is we invite people that we should never invite. So one of the things that I like to point out is when you get a calendar invite right from the get-go, and often you have right across the top, you can accept, but there's that little thing called tentative right next to it. When I don't know why I'm being invited to a meeting, I click on that and I send the leader a question, why am I part of this? Because if you don't start doing that, you will just be, and here's a new word for you, zoom exhausted. You're just exhausted from being on Zoom all day long so you as the conductor invite the right people and you want to tell the right story and video allows you to really enhance that storytelling so i'd like to share another video with you for just a moment about what is important to focus on when you're that leader oops best description of my job i ask the same question like you i love to learn from whoever I get my hands on and I met a movie director uh, who'd had two successful features and we were having dinner and I said God it's so fascinating to me because you have about 150 200 people that come together for six months tops maybe four right and you're spending a hundred thousand dollars every hour to get the shot you have to have these relative strangers become a high efficiency team in no time at all what do you do how do you do it? What's your job? What do you do all day? And he said, well, casting first, right? It's getting the right people, absolutely. And after that, I only have time for two other things when we're, when we're making the movie. One is I fight the biggest fire. So there's always some breakdown, you know, with a location or an actor or, what, or whatever. And I've got to know when to put my resources into the biggest, the absolute biggest problem. Uh, and the other, only other thing that I have time left to do is to make sure that all of my people know the story we're trying to tell so that they can do their jobs. 
and it'll it'll hang together so that they can interpret the set or the the, the lines or the plot or the costume and it'll all be cohesive so it's it's a big part of my day to spend time with my team with our key partners with customers and often I'm fighting the biggest fire but uh, when I'm doing it right it's making sure people understand the story the strategy the mission the values uh, and I spend an awful lot of time uh, whether it's just sitting and listening to people or whether it's working on a business plan or a strategy or the financial version of that the budget or the now I've got Wall Street we're a public company um, and they're a key player and so uh, or, or just just thinking about working on that story that's that's the essence of the of the job so I want to just set that stage because of this visual medium and I want to start talking about the tips and the tricks to really make your meetings when you're using video or using any collaboration tools really powerful. But the most important thing you need to understand is when you're using video, it's not about you. So right now this call is not about me. It's about those of you on the call because it's how you're experiencing me. And every time we get on a video call, people are experiencing you. So what is the experience you're trying to give them no different than if you were in the real world. So another example that I use, it's a new word that I coined, which is the concept of a Zoom, it's a Zoom mullet. Because you can see I'm in a nice sport coat, but you have no idea what's going on below the desk because it's a business up top, party down below. But I give you a very professional image of what you're seeing with me because I dress up. Every call, people are judging you whether you wanna believe it or not. So what is it that you see? So I've played for you so far two videos. Many of you have probably done a video conference and you brought in some web content from YouTube and it was kind of spotty or it cut out or it paused. Always download videos. So trip, this is trip, um, you know, tip number one, download videos onto your hard drive and play them out of your PowerPoint. That way, you know, it's going to be a smooth, clean video experience for the people on the other side of the screen, as opposed to when you're using web content, you have a higher likelihood because of bandwidth problems of giving people a bad experience. And in this new COVID, post-COVID world, it is a new beginning. Video is never going away. Back 100 years ago, when the video conferencing industry started, we used to tell people, video saves travel. Don't, you don't need to travel. You can do video and you can save your travel budgets. But what we now realize is video doesn't really change travel. Right now we're not traveling, but it enhances relationships. Because going back to that video that we showed at the beginning with Trip Crosby, imagine if he actually could see the people around that conference room. You'd have a much different video hygiene. People would not be playing with their dogs. They wouldn't be on their computers playing solitaire because you can see each other. But video also has the problem because a lot of us get video exhausted because we're invited to too many things where video doesn't add value. So I want you to think about using video when it makes sense because you have so many other technologies available for you in what we refer to as the unified communication stack because sometimes an email is more than adequate. Sometimes a quick phone call is more than adequate. As a matter of fact, Nolan and I were speaking yesterday, sometimes text is more than adequate However, big deals have never, to the best of my knowledge, ever been closed on text. So you've got to pick up the phone or you've got to show up. And today, now you show up on video. So the old world of not using video, it used to be a nicety, is now becoming a necessity. And even as we go forward, now that people are addicted to it, behaviors change. Often when there's big shifts in the world, whether it be 9-11, whether it be COVID, we change behaviors and things that were niceties now become necessities. And video as a necessity, how do you use it and how do you get the most out of it? 
and when not to use it is equally important as when to use it. So I thought I'd start off with showing you the environment that I'm sitting in because it's such an important thing. Number one, notice that I have lighting. How many times have you been on a video call with somebody that they are so poorly lit or even worse that they're backlit, the light's coming from behind them and you can't even see them? What kind of experience are they providing for you? And what kind of experience are you providing for them? Number two, I don't use my webcam to be my mic. I actually have a podcasting microphone because the truth of the matter is what's more important is the audio than the video because the human brain will actually forgive bad video, but it will not forgive bad audio. Think about how many times you've been on a cell phone call and somebody starts clipping and you, you know, the voice starts cutting in and out and you say, listen, call me back when you're in a better cell zone. Well, that's the same thing for when you're on a video call. If they can't hear you, they're going to check out. And at that moment in time, what is the point of being on the call? So you need proper lighting, you need a decent camera, and you need to have an environment where you can do all of your work so you can be productive whether you're on a call or whether you're not on a call. I think it's really important. A lot of us are using our laptops and we're connecting to our Wi-Fi. So I did this at 30 minutes before we did this call. I just did a real quick speed test. Most of us connect by Wi-Fi. So at home, because I live in a multi, um, you know, condo with, with lots of apartments in it, and everybody's Wi-Fi is conflicting with everybody else's. So on Wi-Fi, I barely had any bandwidth. So what I do is I make a physical connection and all of you on the back of your modems or Wi-Fi routers, you have an ethernet jack that you can plug into your, into your device. Look at the difference in the speeds. I went from 10 megabits to 120 down. The up was at the same at that moment in time, but it's really important to make that physical connection so you never have a breakdown in your conference. Again, giving the people on the other side a much better experience. And when you're doing video, it is a multi-faceted conversation. And so I like this product called eBeam, something to think about when you're setting up a video room, because that's a video whiteboard. So what I'm writing on my whiteboard, I could actually be sharing with you simultaneously, saving it and using it wherever. Again, a really great microphone, a decent camera, so you can get that full 4K experience because a lot of people now in this new world are having bigger monitors, high definition monitors, so you need to have a decent camera. Even if there's a built-in camera in your laptop, often it's better to get an external USB camera that has a higher frame rate. Lighting is important. For privacy, sometimes, because everybody can listen in, have a good set of headphones that are comfortable to wear for a prolonged period of time. And in the lower right, many of us, if we're using our laptops or we're using certain computers, they don't have an ethernet adapter. So you can get a small adapter right on Amazon to convert from USB to ethernet so you can connect into your router. This is probably the most important tip of all, so you have a quality call beginning to end. And I told you I bring up the concept of video engagement and accountability, video etiquette and video hygiene. This was from a class that we actually taught at LMU, so I know a lot of you on this call know those faces. But if you take a look, video accountability, right then and there, you know exactly who's participating on the call, who's listening, who's not, who's petting the dog, who's on their cell phone, who's with you so you can have that eye-to-eye -eye engagement. But take a look in the lower rows. So we have Keyshawn. He's not using his entire frame, so he's just a little mug shot at the bottom in the dark. Is that the kind of brand experience that you want to provide for someone? Because that's going to say a lot about you. Now, something I would thought I would bring up at this moment in time is if you notice 
I'm filling my entire screen and you see my hands. Communication is an interesting thing. We communicate visually, not just with our voice, not with just the way we move our heads, but also with our hands. Use your entire screen. You have that piece of real estate, maximize the value of that piece of real estate to get the most out of it. And so don't be sitting low down on the bottom. Show everybody what you've got going on. Now, I have a couple of questions. Um, I see, you know, video backgrounds. I use a fun one. I use my New York one uh, because it, it, it's fun. I'm a big fan of virtual backgrounds so you don't see the cluster, the clutter that can be behind you. But what you don't want to have is a background that distracts from everybody. Um, but continuing on, so set up your camera in such a way that you can truly communicate. You can use your hands, you can use your body language, and people can see you. Be properly lit. Use the hand raising. Use the chat feature as opposed to talking over each other because that's something we have a tendency to do as people. But on video, because the signals intertwine, it makes it really hard to have multiple people talking simultaneously. And the other thing I'm a big fan of is number one, turn your video on. Because if I've dressed up to show up to the meeting, I wanna see the people on the other side. And when they turn their video off, I don't know if they're paying attention. I don't know if they're engaged. And that's what I mean by video accountability or video engagement. I, that way, you know I'm engaged with you and I know you're engaged with me. And when we go back to that original video that I showed, you have great examples of that when people aren't even engaged. And the other thing that I am a big fan of and something that we really don't think about is the concept of time. But time is so valuable. If you have to reintroduce people at the beginning of a meeting and you've wasted 10 minutes, if you have 10 people on the call, that's 100 minutes. And when you think about what you're paying people per hour or for their time, respect people's time. So when I do my video meetings, I make sure we start on time and we finish on time to respect other people's time. And I refer to that part as video etiquette as well. So invite the right people, be respectful, show up on time and start on time. Now, well, we're all working from at home in COVID, that's easy, but as life gets back to normal, it's still important to respect people's time. And again, when I talk about using the real estate wisely, I often take the video box of the person I'm talking to and I put it right under the camera. So that helps me look into the camera more often and give that eye to eye experience. So use the real estate on your screen, depending on what it is that you're doing to give a better experience for that person on the other side. Now, as we're doing video meetings, there are some other things that get really complicated. And I refer to that in the security and support area of all this. So first is bring your own device. So if you have a company, you have multiple people that are bringing multiple different devices. So you need to use a technology like Zoom that works on a lot of devices or Microsoft Teams that works on a lot of devices. But at the same time, you can have conflicts. In that original video, they talked about downloading plugins. If you're gonna invite somebody to a meeting and it's the first time you're talking with them, make sure they've downloaded whatever they need to do before that meeting so they're not holding everybody up in the meeting as far as getting that done. Storage is important. Now, Zoom will only let you store on whoever's the host's device or the host has access to the cloud. But in corporate settings, you don't know who's storing what on their device and what they're sharing. And that can become highly problematic. So one of my larger clients that I work with is a major pharmaceutical company. And so they've really locked down people's storage because of security reasons, they don't want people walking out with corporate intellectual property. That's really critical. Standardization. If you're going to have a larger organization, make sure everybody's using the same products because if you're using the same products and the same software at the same rev, 
then you can have a much better IT support experience because often corporate IT people, they know what where they're working on on campus. As an example at LMU, everybody has the same equipment because it's a very standardized environment. But now the people have are disparate and they're working from at home, it makes it that much harder for IT if you don't have a level of standardization and figure out what it is that you can support. But the most important thing I really wanted to talk to about is now that you have those little tips about making your environment work is the concept of workflow. Because we all in our businesses, no matter what your business is, you have a workflow on how you do business. Well, when you add video into that, you need to make the technology invisible, but you need to make the experience almost identical to what it would be if we were working in the same place at the same time. So you have to take a look at what are your workflow strategies? How do you operate sales? So again, one of my clients has 15 different product lines that they sell to Lowe's and Home Depot through distribution. Well, typically they would do line review and they would send 16 people to Lowe's and to Home Depot to walk through each one of the different lines. Well, Lowe's and Home Depot don't want 16 different people traping through their offices. So we created a sales strategy that we send one relationship manager to the line review meeting. And now we're using video to do demonstrations and video to um, also using WebEx so that we can share spreadsheets and we can decide what are the terms, how much product are they going to buy line by line? So the line managers come in specifically for their line review, but there's a relationship manager there. So they're saving a lot of money and actually the, the meetings go longer because you go right into that call. So you actually get a better experience by incorporating video, but it's now embedded in their workflow and you do the same thing for internal meetings and operations. Often we record meetings and that's a double-edged sword. There are pros and there are cons. If you record meetings, that means it's discoverable. So you also have to decide if you're discussing things that may or may not be discoverable, if there's potential litigation, should you record or shouldn't you record and who has access to recordings and who doesn't have access to recordings. And I thought I'd give you one great example of workflow. So one of the companies I work with is a company named Court Call. Court call does remote appearances using video. So we've all watched various television shows, whether it be Law and Order, et cetera, where we've seen the courtroom environment. Well, what court call does, because the courts no longer want people in the court, and they've been doing this for a long time anyway, they've duplicated their workflow to be exactly the way it is that a judge runs the judge's courtroom. So as an example, if the judge needs to have a sidebar, the judge can bring the two people, the two attorneys, and nobody else can hear what's going on. And he can talk to those two attorneys. And let's say it's a civil trial and the judge may say to those two attorneys, you do not want me making the decision. You guys need to work this out because neither one of you are going to like what I've decided. The judge can then, in using video, send them to a virtual meeting room where those two attorneys can talk to each other, no different than if it was in the courthouse, he would send those two attorneys to an ante room to have a conversation and bring them back. So as you're developing your video strategies, really think about workflow so you can embed it in and it's equally natural as if we were in the same environment at the same time. And so with that, I've been talking for a long time um, and I'm hoping there's lots and lots of questions and we can become interactive. So with that, I turn it back to you, Nola. Great. Thanks, Lou. That was really insightful in terms of, you know, what we need to do considering this, this is our lives. We live on video now. So with that, you know, I'd like to pose out there um, Lou's question. You know, we'd love to hear about your business workflow and how you guys are designing your workflow in, in this virtual environment. Um, and perhaps, you know, as the questions come, you can raise your hand. Again, you can pose it in, in the Q&A section. And perhaps, you know, I can talk a little bit about our workflow at the College of Business Administration at LMU. 
um, we've completely gone virtual in terms of, you know, um, just our organization. We use Microsoft Teams to communicate. I found that collaboration on Teams is fantastic and we actually get much more work done. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I am respectful of people's times, but, you know, we do get together and, and um, have calls like our traditional phone calls, so to speak, um, but it's all digital via Teams. And, um, you know, the one thing I do miss is just walking into, you know, the water cooler conversations or the coffee break conversations, which we're figuring out how we can do, but um, because that is definitely a big part of, of um, non-formalized um, approaches in, in our organization. So we'd love to hear from you in terms of, you know. And that, that, that's a great point. And one of my large pharmaceutical clients, we've sort of addressed those things with some really cool features. So first, when we work in an office, we have a tendency, when you work in an office, it's kind of a marathon. I know I'm getting in at eight o'clock in the morning. I'm staying till six o'clock at night. I have plenty of time to work through that. And so we stretch the workload out during the entire day. When people work from at home, it's a series of sprints. We talked about this yesterday. So you go to the refrigerator, you go work for another half hour, then you go back to the fridge and see if anything magically reappeared. And then you, you do that, then you go back to work, then you walk the dog, then you go back to work. So it's a series of sprints but we're alone. And so there's a very large out in the Valley um, pharmaceutical company and they're on the Microsoft Teams platform. And we created for them two different things, something we call the virtual hallway and the virtual coffee room. Because so much creativity occurs in the coffee room just as a random conversation or in the hallway when you run into somebody, say, hey, come on back to my office. Let's talk more about that. So in their Microsoft feed in Teams, they can at any given time click on a coffee room or click on a hallway. Clicking on the coffee room, we built out a matrix depending on what building you're in and what department you're in. Similar to that's how you would run into your regular coffee room. You can click on that. Now, sometimes you may be the first person there in video. So you can hang out there while you're doing some other stuff. And then when other people come in, you can now collaborate just in spontaneously, or you can join an existing conversation because there are four people, five people in there, which is exactly how it goes. The virtual hallway, we use the concept of presence. So they know through Microsoft, you know who's online, who's available, who's not online. So we created this really cool user interface um, it's kind of a virtual reality, a 2D version of virtual reality. And you can take your avatar up to somebody else's avatar. You see their name and it says what department they're in and they can put a little blurb in what they're working on. You say, that's really interesting. I'd like to know more or I'd like to work with you on that. And you can tap them on the shoulder. And I know in the real world, we're not allowed to tap anybody on the shoulder, but we can still do that in the virtual world without getting in trouble. And they can then start a conversation, whether it be a text message, they can go through the entire unified communications platform. I can send you a text message, then I can elevate it to a phone call right then and there, or we can elevate it to a video call or to full collaboration where we can share a screen or work on the same document. Mm -hmm. So incorporating those kind of things into your workflow so we don't feel as disparate and we can take those sprints and make them feel more like the environment that we're working in. Great, thanks for that. So we do have some questions, Lou, and this is actually a really great question because you talked about, um, you know, accessing or purchasing, you know, different types of hardware and, and so forth to support the online and virtual environment with video conferencing. But how do you handle digital divide issues people who don't have strong internet or instability. So how, 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 what, how would you handle the- And again, internet instability, you gotta plug in because that's the, 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 best, the best thing I can tell you is you wanna be plugged in as opposed to using Wi-Fi or using your mobile hotspot. Um, that's a tough one. If, the, if you just don't have it in your community, you don't have it in your community. Um, you want to make the most out of it. Now, sometimes, unfortunately, if somebody has bad internet, you got to turn the video side off and they only participate audio and data. So you can share the screen because the video is a bandwidth hog. 
So I think that, that that's something that you can be aware of to maximize that experience. Great. Great. And um, James asks, Lou, what changes do you see coming on the form um, uh, uh, from the video providers in the next year or two? So what, what do you see coming from the so video? First of all, James, it's, it's great to see that you're here. Just for those of you who don't know, James is one of my Boston friends. Go Pats! But with that said, and now we have Cam Newton. How cool is that? But anyway, um, it's interesting. Back in the day, we had dramatically different, James, don't write that, that's bad, um, <laughs> Dolphins fan. But um, back in the day, you had a dramatically different system for a large room, a medium room, and a small room. But today, the difference between the rooms are really the camera set, the speakers, and the microphones, because you don't need a different piece of hardware, because everything now, the PC itself, is strong enough to host the video conference, and there's so much going on in the cloud. So the things you're going to see in the next couple of years from the various hardware providers are more about tracking cameras so they can follow you so you don't have to block yourself when I'm only in this small space, as well as better microphones in rooms. So one of the issues that we're going to face at the university when we're bimodal, we have people in the class and we have people online simultaneously. Um, that creates an issue of are the kids in the class going to be able to speak to the kids online because if you're depending on where that microphone is, they may not hear the kids online, may not hear the kids in the class. So they're now working on beamforming and multiple beamforming microphones to get a much better audio gain experience, not dissimilar to the old Polycom speakerphone, but only even more enhanced. So that's the biggest change is how the camera interacts with people or these 360 degree cameras. You can literally put it in the center of the room and depending on who's speaking, the camera will focus on who's ever speaking. Now that doesn't work in a, in, a, in a classroom if you're in rows, but if you're doing a U-shaped kind of classroom, that works really well. So you're gonna see that kind of thing. And from the service providers, such as the Zooms, um, you're going to see a host of features not dissimilar to like, like right now, Microsoft Teams is the worst of Zoom and the worst of Slack put into one, one platform. But so you're going to see that being made a lot easier so people can communicate. And again, leveraging that unified communication stack, sometimes you just want it to be a text message. And so you're going to see your phone as part of it, as well as all of your devices. So they're going to be logging on to everything simultaneously in a much easier fashion. Right now, if you're on a Zoom call on your PC and you're the host, it's really hard to move then over to your phone and continue it. So you're going to see those kind of things being made simpler. Mm -hmm. um, and again, as bandwidth gets cheaper and more abundant, the nature of the video is gonna get higher, um, better. And then the one thing that you're gonna see maybe in about three to four years, in the dead center of your monitor is gonna be the camera. Right now they can't do that because the heat of the monitor actually is, is problematic for the chipset for, uh, for the cameras like you have on your cell phone. But as they're working through that problem, so then we will have true eye to eye because where I'm looking, I'm going to be looking right at you. There's going to be a camera. So those are the major changes. That's great. And so just to, just to add to that really quick, and then I'll address everyone else's questions. Um, in terms of direct to consumer, do you think that you know there'll be changes and and what they use? Because most of the time, for all of us who work from home, we don't necessarily have. A separate camera. We rely heavily on, you know, the the video that's already installed, like you mentioned. We, you know, our mobile phone. Do you foresee any changes for just your traditional consumers in terms of how we? I think again, camera technology keeps evolving, but one of the things I would suggest is, and I'm going to use a dead word, dictionary, because nobody <laughs> uses that anymore. Put your laptop on your dictionary so it's higher. Because again, from, a, from an experience perspective, there's nothing worse than underneath chin view where you're watching people chewing. So if you raise your camera a little bit, you get a closer to an eye and eye experience. 
And again, use your entire piece of real estate so you can communicate with your hands. Great. So we do have um, an anonymous person who asks, love the idea of, of virtual hallways. So do we need to hire a company to set this up or can, can we build it all homegrown? If you weren't anonymous, I'd send you an email. <laughs> um, but that's, you know, some of the companies I work with, so um, do that. So one of my companies is a company named Yorktel out of New Jersey. And we actually did it for the large pharmaceutical company. Um, we, we, we had a great conversation about all the things they felt they were missing. And then we provided that solution. And it's based on Microsoft Teams, but using the um, SDK layer, we actually built something on top of that and embedded it into Teams. So you do need a third party to set it up. I mean, you could sort of fake it if you had two different Zoom accounts. You could have one Zoom account always on as the virtual hallway and the other Zoom account for your meetings. But that gets a little more complicated. And you can't definitely, you definitely can't do it on the free 40 minute one. Great, thanks. And, and Rochelle has a question. What are your thoughts about the fact that being virtual allows people to mix that wouldn't normally? So instead of restricting a virtual coffee room to certain people in a certain building, what not does not what not it open well, sorry would it not open up to inspire more mixing across different teams being Quite, well in the situation that we did up in thousand oaks they specifically wanted the people that were collaborating to collaborate you could absolutely mix it up that that's really simple but i think zoom does give you an opportunity to communicate with people you don't ordinarily communicate um, so back in the day with my company, PictureTel, I would get up first thing in the morning. And so I would, back, back then, you know, video conferencing systems were huge. It wasn't a PC, but I had a video conferencing system and I had digital phone lines to my home. I get up first thing in the morning and I would call my Australian office because it was late at night for them. I would talk to those folks. And then I would talk to my folks in Singapore and I would talk to my folks in Japan. Then I would go to the office and at the end of the day, before I left the office, um, I, I, you know, I, in the morning, I would have been speaking to my folks in, in uh, Europe. And at the end of the day, I could still talk to the folks at the end of the day in Japan. So I could go around the world without ever leaving Andover, Massachusetts, or without leaving Marblehead, Massachusetts. You can do that now. And so I think Zoom does allow us to get to people. And because you're not wasting travel time, you can just use that time in a whole host of different ways. So it's really taking advantage of that time. And at least for the immediate foreseeable future, people are still enamored with, oh my God, this stuff is so cool. You know, for old folks like me and James who have been aware of this stuff forever, um, it's not as cool and it's just who we are. I mean, my kids, they'll send me a text message. And if I pick up the phone and call, they won't answer, but they'll still answer a FaceTime. It's, it's mind boggling to me in the generations. Um, so you can reach out. People will take a Zoom call. It's really fascinating. Zoom happy hours. We do that in our department to reconnect. Okay. Great think, question. Yeah, that is a great, great question. And I think um, your response transitions very well into this next question from Ella. If you're hosting a Zoom session where the meeting participants don't know each other very well, what's a good way to break the ice on a group call? So first off, I'm a big fan of doing your homework. So I will have passed, the, if it's a call where people don't know each other, I would have passed some sort of um, bio, bios around. One of the things though that we do with one of the companies that I'm on the board of Every person in the organization now has a 60 second video introduction where they say something about themselves and something fun. And we send them around before a meeting so you know who you're going to be talking with. Because you, once again, when you see somebody, it changes the level of engagement. Hopefully for the better. But it, you do see a difference. So we have these little one minute video bios. So share them in advance, because again, when you have a whole host of people on a call, you don't want to do 50 minutes of introduction means your meeting is 50 minutes longer. Um, and then, you know, introductions, then you can do different kinds of icebreakers that are your traditional, just if you were in the same room, 
you, you really want to make video almost as if you're in the same room when you're not. That's the whole point of it. It's just part of the workflow. Great. And Maria had a question about engagement. Now, in regards to engagement, as a host, what do you do ahead of time to ensure everyone is engaged and contributing during a meeting? I often send out an email um, asking people, what's the most important question you want answered? So I make sure that I'm getting that information out to people, which often keeps them engaged. And the backup plan is always humor when all else fails. It's true. Um, our anonymous attendee also asks, um, which company do you think will be a winner in the video conferencing world? Zoom, Microsoft, Cisco? Well, it's interesting, you know, back in the day, you know, it was a whole different set of folks and, and these, all of these were something else before they were. So in the hardware space, you're still going to have Logitech and a company named Poly, which was my old company, Picture, it became PictureTel, then Polycom and now Poly. So, live, so you'll have those two and you go back to Jack Welsh, be number one, number two are out. Microsoft will always win. So if you think about it, Cisco, Cisco owns the infrastructure. So everything they do is from the, from the infrastructure out to the edge, which is the system. So they're not great with the user interfaces. Microsoft is from the outside, from the edge. They're really big on user interface in, but they're an engineering led company. So everything Microsoft does is overly complicated. The reason Zoom has been winning this war and we're all feeling so Zoom-tastic about it is they made, they took the 10 features everybody uses, took all of the other stuff out and made it really simple. So I really do think those are the three winners from the service providers but I think the real two winners, Cisco will always be there, but it's gonna be Microsoft and Zoom. Do you want the real simple version or do you want something that's really robust? And that's not just me, all the literature, cause I'm a geek and I read all the literature and that's what all the pundits are saying. So I'm actually just repeating. <laughs> Fantastic. And so this is more in terms of the academic classroom, is there, or just in cl class, um, is there a right size of class for a Zoom-based class, like a synchronous kind of class, for example? Well, as a CEO, I always think about economics. I will tell you the Brady Bunch nine square is the ideal square for everybody to talk to each other, but economically it's not. <laughs> so I, that, that, that's a real tough one. And it also depends on the instructor. How nimble is the instructor to engage everybody? Now, and that's the, the, the question, actually, I'm going to morph it. It's when should something be truly an interactive session? When should something be a recorded webinar that people can watch on demand? Because that's really the two, two if you can pe keep people engaged, and I'm telling you, when you cross 20, it's almost impossible to keep people engaged. And you now have to start scrolling between screens. And so now the technology is no longer invisible. It makes it much harder to have a full engagement. And that's when I think um, you have to either be really creative and do small groups simultaneously. Um, but that's one person's, and again, I, I really think it's the educator decides what, what can they manage best. And it's also the type of students. If you have really engaged students, you can have a gazillion because they're really engaged and they're gonna get the most out of it. And if you have a you know, mandatory class that nobody wants to be there, four is too many. Thank you, thanks for that. Um, so Brentley has a question. How do you ensure you're getting work productivity from your remote workers through video conferencing? That's a phenomenal question. That's a great question. That's a great question. I actually, one of the speeches I give on a regular basis when I'm doing my thing from stage back when you used to be able to do conferences in real time um, was four generations in the workplace. So my generation, you know, you had to be the first one in, you had to be the last one out and people measured were you engaged by how long you sat at your desk. But now you have, you know, the millennials and the Gen Z's, their world has always been a world on demand. They don't need to watch the 10 o'clock news at 10 o'clock. They watch it when they want. They don't need to own a car. They have an app for that. 
So their world is really about they do what they want when they want. So it's not about how do you manage them. It's how do you manage the body of work that people need to do. So it's not when they're working, when they're not working. Here's the stuff that needs to get done. Here's the body of work. And you need to communicate that. That gets back to being the storyteller. Here's the story. Here's the mission. Here's the body of work. And I'm going to check in with you. And if you have problems, don't wait until it's too late. Here's your deadline. That's the other thing. Everything needs to have a deadline. Because if things don't have a deadline, they go on forever. So here's the body of work. I need it by next Tuesday. If you're going to be late, tell me on Monday. Don't tell me on Wednesday. And that's more of a corporate culture thing. That's not a technology thing. And it's no different than if you were in the same office, you're going to walk down to see them, pick up the phone. Just how's it going? And as a leader, just check in with your troops. That's such an important thing to do. That simple check-in. Show people you care. The more a leader shows their team that they care, the more the team will rise to the occasion. So that's well beyond a tech question. That's a leadership question. So thank you for that. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. We still have plenty of time left. So if there are any other questions, um, you know, please feel free to type them in or raise your hand, uh, whatever it may be. Um, but just going back to your leader, the leadership perspective, um, what are some great ways to manage teams online? You know, um, I, I'm kind of learning as I go using Microsoft Teams, setting up various team channels to address various different kinds of questions because we're talking about workflow. Um, what are what other advice do you have to manage teams effectively in the virtual world and also using video conferencing, not too much, but just enough so we don't get too Zoom exhausted. And that's really um, a phenomenal question. So number one, I'm from the school of thought, keep it simple. I, I like that Microsoft allows you to have unlimited versions of teams and work groups, but then people get work grouped out. So I think it's from a high level, separating what's interesting versus what's important. Mm -hmm. And if we focus on what's important, then the other stuff can come in on the side, but it's really, what are the important things? What's really the mission? What are the specific things we need to get done? Starting with them, I think is what's really the focus. And I think that's how you can lead people and you can inspire people and you don't exhaust them. You focus on the important. So for example, in, in your car, you probably have a tachometer and you probably have an automatic transmission. Therefore, the RPM in your car is interesting. It's not important. The speedometer, especially if there's a cop behind you, is really important. So knowing the difference between what to measure, you know, and knowing the difference between causality and, you know, correlation. It's nice to talk about the things that correlate. It's really important to talk about the things that have cause. Separating those two things and life will be good. No, that's, that's actually really good advice, focusing on what's important. Um, so we have just a few minutes left. We also want to be respectful of everyone's time. So if there are any other, are there any other questions? We're totally, we're here. You've got an expert on video conferencing. Um, you know, we are moving into this new reality or it's been a reality, but now it's everybody's reality. So. And if there's anything I can do for you, send me an email. It's lewis.jaffe, L-E-W-I-S dot J-A-F-F-E at L-M-U dot E-D-U. And I'll be more than glad to take any of the questions offline if I can help. And I'll be sending everyone a recording of this session and I'll also include Lou's email um, in, in in that as well. So any other questions? That's some really great. You know, you're going once. <laughs> going once. Going twice. All right. Well, oh, we have one. Thank you. Um, where can I get a good Zoom background? Um, good background. So 
there are, there are so many websites dedicated to that and more every single day. And you can use any JPEG. So you can create something, you can create something really fun in Adobe Illustrator or even on PowerPoint and turn it into a JPEG and it's yours. But there are so many really cool websites or, you know, um, just any, any um, you can, I think it's about up to a 15 second. So mine is a 15 second loop of Times Square because it, it does limit the size of the background it'll show. Just download a video. Just respect people's intellectual property. That's all I ask. Yes, very true, very true. Are there any other questions from the audience? Thank you for that. All right, well, well. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much um, for joining us today. Please join us for our next webinar next, this Thursday actually with Rochelle Webb as we discuss the intersection of COVID business and the social movement taking place with Black Lives Matter. So please join us and this Thursday and we've got more coming your way. Thank you everyone for joining us. Take care.